Ted is a, an athlete who certainly doesn't need an introduction. Um, I have a long list of his accolades here and I'll probably get them wrong because Ted knows that he's way better than numbers, uh, with numbers than me, but two-time Olympic champion, five-time world champion, three-time world GS champion, five-time GS title holder, 336 World Cup starts, 25 World Cup victories, and 52 World Cup podiums across five disciplines, which I know is something that you're really proud of, Ted. Um, incredible career. We're all, I think, going to be a, a, a little bit emotional here. If you can just talk a little bit about um, the decision and what kind of emotions you're feeling right now with all the posts that have been going up. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's been a very mixed bag of emotions, that's for sure. You know, it's, it's sad. It's, um, it's fun. It's like exciting to think about the next step. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's every, it's every emotion. I mean, it's pretty crazy to, to be on this tour for, 17 years and now walking away and think about how much my life has changed over the years and um think of everything i've done is pretty surreal you know i never thought as you know a, a kid that was getting his butt kicked by you know 15 seconds of races as a teenager and you know not even being close to the best kid as a um on my park city ski team to like end up where i've been is is beyond my wildest expectations and it's just crazy to think about what i've done in the moment, I was like always charging and hungry for more, um, but to sit back and look at it now is uh, is pretty wild. So um, I like wanted to do like uh, say like thank you to all the people. I like wrote a long post on Instagram today, and uh, <laughs> even just thank <laughs> sorry, yeah, thinking about thanking all those people because I. Um, Makes me uh, um, I'll leave it to that post because I wouldn't be able to make make it through it. So, uh, yeah, thank you to all those people. Awesome, Ted. Um, I know we have a lot of people who have worked with you for many years on this call, and I think Brian Pinelli has a great question that I would love to start with. Brian, um, go ahead. Which one, Megan? I have two. Questions, you tell me which you prefer. Let's let's talk about the pink helmet. Sounds good. Hey, Ted, congratulations on your decision. Thanks for the chats over the years. Uh, I remember some years ago uh, in Kitzbühel, you, you ran the downhill, maybe slightly out of your comfort zone. And I remember you sporting your pink neon shred helmet at the most dangerous downhill in the world. And uh, you were just telling me how Bodhi was up on the top up with you at the top, just riding you, giving you a hard time, saying, Lee, what are you doing in that pink helmet? And, and please tell the story. But I seem to recall you said it was actually quite emasculating. <laughs> uh, I mean, part of like from the get go of why I started Shred is I wanted to bring more flair and fun into ski racing and have, you know, a different attitude about it all. Um, and Shred was especially the band known having loving crazy colors. And my first time down Kids Fuel, I definitely was like, oh, I should wear a neon pink helmet. Like that would be uh, appropriate for skiing the gnarliest, manliest, toughest hill in the World Cup. Um, a good initiation for it. So, um, yeah, I mean, even like before that, I remember like when I had pink goggles in like 2006, you know. Bodie and Darren both were riding me in, 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 in training and sold and stuff. So um, that was even more of a, a reason to do it, I guess. <laughs> what, uh, what, what, did, what did you tell Bodie there up at the top? I mean, I assume you were defending yourself, right? I mean, if you have the confidence to wear a neon pink helmet down Kitsfield, then you have the confidence to go and charge it. <laughs> or you better have the confidence to go and charge it, I guess. <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> Thanks, thanks, Brian. Um, I think we have a question from APA. Um, Nick, are you on the line? If not, I can ask um, on Nick's behalf. Ted, who were the toughest, most talented opponent, opponents over the years? Um, and who, like, meaning who were you the most proud to be in races and which were the most memorable races in this regard? 
I mean, of course, Marcel Hersher was, you know, my toughest competitor. Um, there wasn't anybody I loved beating more than Marcel. Um, and there was nobody that I hated getting beat by more than Marcel. But I obviously had to get very used to getting beat by him since uh, that became a norm for all of us. But uh, what he did in the sport pushed all of us. I mean, he raised my level for sure. Um, when he won his first GS title, I felt like that was one of my best years of my career skiing wise. And he beat me. And that really pushed me to be a much better skier and raise my game. And um, yeah, I mean, it's just it's crazy to be able to have his number for a couple of years, which not very many people can say. And obviously, he went to crush me for years and years and years after that. But uh, he was definitely somebody who pushed me a lot. Um, you know, I was lucky to have like a lot of good friends on the tour that were my closest competitors as well. And we push each other a lot. Guys like Felix and Julian and Axel and Jansrud and um, Jens are like some of my closest friends on tour over the years. And, you know, we always pushed each other. We got to train with each other a lot. Um, so those are like relationships I really cherish, but those also made me a better skier as well. Thank you, Ted. I think Alex Cabrero has a, uh, a question out there. Alex, you can unmute yourself. Hey, Ted, thanks for the time here and congratulations on a retirement. Um, Thank you. I wanted to ask you, what has the support been like in Park City? You're a Park City guy. Seeing Park City grow into this Olympic town, what has it been like for you to, to have that support um, and being just a Park City guy and where, it's being, uh, and where the city is today? I'm definitely a product of growing up in Park City. Um, growing up there with the World Cup every single year, growing up watching the best in the world, ski down the hill that I trained on every day was hugely inspirational. Um, the town has a huge sports following. Everybody's into skiing. Um, everybody really supports the Park City ski team and really supports like their local heroes, which is, is amazing. Um, I mean, I couldn't have done it if I grew up any other town, that's for sure. Um, and over the years, like with my successes, you know, they've been hugely supportive. So um, I wouldn't be where I am without, you know, Park City as, as its town and, um, you know, the Park City ski team and all the coaches and athletes and like my friends going out. I mean, that was what I feel really lucky is uh, having the friend, friend group that I had. Um, yeah, um, all those years and really pushing me to be, be where I am today. Awesome. Thanks, Ted. I saw a picture of you and Marcy and I had to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we have, a, we have a special guest on the line. Uh, can you turn on your video, RCS? Yeah, I'm on. <laughs> okay, I'm trying to find you because I would. Okay, um, Ryan has a question for you, Ted. Hey, Ted, um, teammate here, uh, huge fan. Congrats on such a phenomenal career. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, what do you think will be the most important part of your legacy? that you're leaving for the next generation of the USB team? I, don't, I think that's something you free to, to say. I don't, I don't know, it's hard, for, it's hard for me to like say what my legacy is. I think it's hard for somebody to like write their own legacy. So hopefully, you know, inspired kids to, to push hard and ski fast and love the sport of ski racing more and, uh, you know, go their own path and try to ski differently, try to ski the way they wanted to. Hopefully, I helped make them think ski racing was cooler, think it was something to pursue. So, um, yeah, you tell me, Ryan. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm super proud that, like, I got to ski with you for all those years and see where you've come now. It's, uh, it's awesome. I mean, that was one of the most proud things to see you win a, win a World Cup. So, yeah, yeah. Thank you. I mean, I think speaking for you, I, I mean, you're such a huge leader of our team. Like not just tech guys, but I think the entire team. And I mean, the wisdom that you've kind of dispelled on all of us, we definitely, we're all better skiers because of it. And we want to be here without you. So, I mean, it's just a huge thank you from our entire team um, with the role model that you were your entire career. Um, I mean, you're a spectacular skier, but you're also a spectacular human being. And I think we all really appreciate what you've been able to accomplish on and off the slopes. So. Yeah. Thanks, man. Yeah, we'll miss you. Ryan, thanks for joining us. Oh, that's awesome. Um, 
Brian, Penelope, I think you have another question that uh, I would love to hear you ask Ted. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Megan. Uh, Ted, uh, kind of playing off what Ryan said a little bit. Yeah, I mean, you've obviously been a mentor and you know we see what you've meant to guys like River and Tommy Ford and, and RCS. I guess, uh, you know, these last couple of years you've been, you know, fighting it a little bit with your injuries, but um, just tell me about always trying to mentor, help improve these guys. Uh, could you ever see yourself as a coach? And, and what do you th and what do you think? You know, Tommy's obviously had his success, and, and Rivers chasing it still. Uh, what do you think these guys need to do to kind of carry on the the GS legacy with the U.S. ski team? Not 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 easy ski boots to jump into. Yeah, Tommy and Ryan are two guys that I've skied with probably the most over the last ten plus years, and to see both those guys come into their own as stars in the World Cup now of their own has been something that I've been super proud to watch. Um, you know, they're challenging and pushing me during, you know, my, some of my best years of my career. And um, it's been really fun to see them go through the ebbs and flows, but now to go in and win World Cups is, is pretty amazing. Um, River is a young guy that I've, you know, just been with for the last few years, but who obviously has a ton of potential and is starting to finally break through. So it's cool to see where it is. I mean, if I, I'm really bummed that Tommy and Ryan are, are injured right now because um, what they've done is, is meant a lot to me to watch them do that. And uh, yeah, I'm just super proud to have been like a small, small part in there uh, and pushing them forward, I guess a little bit as well. So um, yeah, I mean, I've always loved being part of the team and that's like from the get go, I love training in the team atmosphere. I loved getting pushed by my teammates. I love pushing my teammates. I loved, pick up sports after training, um, just the whole competitive atmosphere made it so much fun. I can imagine, you know, going out there and beating my head against the wall by myself in training wouldn't sound like that much fun and wouldn't be where I am today if that's what I had to do. So, um, yeah, it's been, it's been awesome. It's been a super fun, cool group of guys. Could you just briefly, could you see yourself someday as a, as a okay. tech coach? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, man, coaches work so freaking hard and it's uh, not a glorious job and it is a slog and it is brutal. And I can't thank my coaches enough for what they do. And because of all those reasons, I can never see myself doing it. <laughs> Maybe here and there is like just to help out for a handful of days and just impart some, some pieces of wisdom. But I, I couldn't do what they do because they do all the hard parts of what you do as a ski racer, but none of the fun parts. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Ted. Yeah. Thanks, Ted. Okay, I'm going to ask everyone to um, mute themselves, just a reminder, and then I'm going to remove the pin from you for a second, Ted, and we have a special guest who has named himself Stenmark True GS God. Um, so <laughs> If, if you're out there, um, please turn on your camera. Yeah, I just wanted to know if um, I was your real inspiration in Giant Slalom. You, Felix, uh, you are my inspiration because you are just a slalom weenie who could end up winning GSs. So that was very <laughs> inspirational for sure. <laughs> hey, sorry. Hey. Now you see when you're retired, you have time to do stuff like that. Yeah. As I tell you, <laughs> yeah. 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 Good to see you're working out for the first time in years. <laughs> you, know, you know, here, my, my belly. Please do me one favor, Ted. You yeah. said you will take care about your kids now, but. Um, just do per day 20 push-ups. Don't do the same mistake as I, as I did. <laughs> Otherwise, you turn to become a little, yeah, you know, you know what. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, but but thanks. my how do how do how do you like my my username? Yeah, I mean your username is is the truth. <laughs> what, do you, what can you say about you know Stenmark, who's won the most races ever? And um, yeah. I can't argue with that at all. It doesn't feel like a slight in the least bit. <laughs> no, Ted, serious. I just want to say thanks for the last, wow, how many years had we together? I mean, what a time we had. And really, I appreciate it every second with you, my friend. And uh, we will keep in touch and yeah, for enjoy sure. your last race. And I told you a couple of days ago, just kick some, some, some 
young skiers as it's just one more time because for me you are the best GS skier ever so Thank and now you. before Thank I start you. crying and you start crying <laughs> hey, go for it, buddy. We, will keep, we will talk as soon because I have to keep on going now because otherwise my wife is kicking my ass <laughs> <laughs> thank you Felix bye bye I'll talk Thanks, to Heather. you later thanks bud that means okay. a lot I'm gonna pin you <laughs> again Ted okay I think uh, Nick Leonard has a question so you can go ahead and unmute yourself Nick um, hi can you hear me now yeah hi Ted um, so I'm with the Cortina 2021 news service and the team captain's meeting is going on and, and all sorts of things. I just wanted to ask you, you know, skiing GS, you just had this smooth curve style. Everybody else is like cutting and carving so hard and you would just seem like you were just cruising. I mean, was that natural to you? Or is that something you had to learn? And, and you know, what was the sort of impact of, of that style, you know, on, on races that came after you? My style is really a product of the years and years I had free skiing after training growing up. Um, and like I was saying before, like being a product of that first generation of kids growing up on carving skis, like going out with my buddies and like trying to play on our skis, trying to carve on our elbows or and on our armpits, like that really like translated into my skiing and, and taking that flow. And I think what was able to separate me for a lot of years was that I didn't like follow the traditional check trajectory and how to ski. I didn't try to copy one person. I tried to take bits and pieces of skiers that I was inspired by and then meld them into my own way of skiing and, and really trust that like, if I did what I thought was the way to do it, that I could win races and trusted that, um, then my like ownership in that and, and pushing myself forward and, and all that. So, I'm glad that I didn't try to like copy or emulate perfectly one person. I tried to ski my own way and, and glad it ended up working out the way it did. And um, yeah. Brilliant. Thanks a lot and good luck next week. We'll see you here. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Nick. I think um, Mike Jaquid's calling in from Hugo Coffee and he has a question. I don't know, Mike, if you want to elaborate on your question that you asked, because I know that uh, Ted just spoke to it now. Um, but yeah, Ted, yeah, go ahead. What's up, Ted? Hey, Mike. <laughs> How's it, bud? Good thing. Yeah, you. Uh, that was just, you kind of just started on it. I, I'm kind of just wondering like where the physicality of your scheme kind of caught up to maybe where your head was at, right? Like, you know, you, you always had these new angles and a new way of, of straightening out a GS course like nobody else was able to do. And I'm wondering if that was in your head before your body caught up or if you were finding it in your body and then and then you're able to change your thought process going into a course because of, of where your body was. You're saying like towards the end of my career as I fell well, apart? I'm, no, I'm saying at like, the height. Not, no, 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 yeah, yeah, exactly. No, and maybe, and maybe that's what happened, right? Um, I don't know, you tell me, but uh, like, you know, in the heyday, right? When you were Mr. GS, um, was it physical or mental or a combination of both of, of what you were able to do um, with straightening out those GS courses? I mean, ski racing is a hugely mental sport. I think it's probably one of the toughest mental sports out there because you have such a small window of opportunity and basically zero margin of error. And I think mean, the mental side was what made me so strong for a lot of those years, but the technical side of like trusting my own skiing and trusting in the years, I think year and um that was like something that was always really important in my skiing was that i got a ton of miles um i think for probably like a six eight year stretch like i probably took more runs in a in a course gs super g downhill whatever my like combination of runs total by more than any other racer in the world for for a bunch of years um and that was really important to me um that like was what shaped my skiing what allowed me to have the confidence of course to do what i was able to do and and trust it to like go on my elbow, like fully laid over as far as possible and know that it was gonna come around is because I had, you know, thousands of miles of, of doing that under my belt. Thanks bud, we'll see you back here. Thanks, good to see ya. <laughs> um, Ted, I know you've talked a lot about um, in, in the videos that have been published recently about Schladming 2013. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I know it was probably one of the biggest and most special 
runs for you um, in terms of just winning almost everything, <laughs> basically. <laughs> Uh, Schladming World Champs in 2013 was definitely the best week of racing in my career. Um, I think like every racer that is good in multiple events coming into championship is hoping for winning multiple medals, hoping for winning multiple times. It's like always a goal, but those expectations rarely play out. So to be able to pull off what I did was was un unbelievable. I mean, I knew going in that my G Super G was in a good spot, had a chance there, but Axel was skiing amazing at the time too, and nearly unbeatable. And I knew, and combined, like my slalom was good enough, my speed was good enough. I had a chance, and then I was obviously having the best season in giant slalom in my, my career. And I'm glad I actually didn't know leading up to the giant slalom that if I won that, it'd be the first time I'd been done in 45 years or whatever, because that would have even added an extra bit of pressure. That's for sure. So, um, pretty amazing. Um, run there, something I was super proud of. Ever since I was a kid, you know, I looked up to guys like Lasse Shoes and Amat, who were multi-event skiers and um, boater. I never wanted to be pegged as, you know, one event guy. And um, obviously Giant Slam was far and away my best discipline and that's how it went. But to be able to get on the podium in all those events and, and win those three three events in, in one world championships is, is pretty surreal and, and one of the most proud things in my career. So let's rewind a little bit more to um, your first Olympic start, which was also Olympic gold. Can you talk a little bit about that and um, kind of what was going through your head going into the second run? And I know you had an exchange with Bodhi as well. So you can just talk about what it was like also to, to be his teammate and to learn about what it was like to be a multi-event skier that was excelling in every discipline as well. And going to the Olympics in 2006, I was just psyched to go to the Olympics. Um, two years before that, I never would have guessed I'd be going to the Olympics. Um, I was just excited for the experience. I, I thought like maybe I had a chance to medal in the Psalm or something. At that time, I was doing really well in Psalm, but never in my wildest dreams, I think I would, you know, walk away with a gold medal. And, you know, in the combined, it was funny. And like earlier in the morning, I was riding up the lift with Jatil Dianzri, one of my close friends, and like, he was a slalom skier at the time, which is funny looking back at it now, but he was like, you know, we like, we have a chance if we like really like throw it down today. Like we have, we've got a chance. I was like, like, we don't have a chance. Like, come on, man. Like that's kind of too crazy. Um, and that like started getting the ball rolling for me. Um, I didn't have a very good downhill run. I was, you know, three seconds out or so on 30 something place, but you know, it was only like a second and a half or something off of Benny and some of the slalom skiers. And so I was like, ah, I mean, like if things go right, I could maybe like claw my way in there and then ended up having one of the best slalom runs of my life. The first run moved all the way up to third place. Um, Bodhi was leading, but straddled. And I remember we were like in the spin room when that happened, he was like extremely nonchalant about it, but he was like, go get it, dude. Like the way you're skiing, you can, you can do it. And um, just throw down the way you know how to and I remember like sitting there just like thinking like I'm 21 years old like most of my like good friends are like racing college right now like what would they think if I won an Olympic medal that would be pretty wild and then I like knew I had to get that out of my mind and just just try to ski and just try to let myself ski in a free way and um, was able to have another amazing run afterwards and uh, and came down the lead by a second and some and watched you know Avica come down a little ways behind me and then watch uh, Benny lose time at every split then you know straddle towards the end and just a complete shock I mean I just remember like being flabbergasted having no idea what was really happening and you know Scott McCartney and Stephen Nyman came out and tackled me to the ground lifted me on the shoulders and I, I still look at those pictures it gives me goosebumps so it's uh it's pretty wild to think back on and just like to achieve that goal as a young kid was um, was a dream come true and um, definitely like set the stage like was a huge motivator for me in a lot of ways like I knew that like I really would have to step up after that in order to like step into those shoes and not just be a one-hit wonder so that was a big motivator and really pushed me to to end up doing the things I did later on. Awesome Ted and I know mm, 
after that, you, as you started growing into yourself and your confidence and your abilities, um, you also weren't, you were not quiet. You were very outspoken in terms of the rules and et cetera that um, FIS was implementing with the, with the new skis. Can you talk a little bit about that and the, the op-ed that you wrote as a result of it? Um, and then you ended up conquering that the new ski set up the next season and winning the, the globe again. So just talk a little bit about that. I've always been an opinionated and at times outspoken person about things that I disagree with. And um, at the time, yeah, FIS made rules that didn't make any sense for our sport. Um, they did under the guise of science and um, no athlete input and all that. And I was pissed and so were the rest of the athletes. I mean, I didn't talk to a single athlete that thought it was a good idea. And I thought I really had to like speak to that because nobody else was. And so I took it on myself to, to fight against what they're trying to do. And, um, and also that beyond that, they're changing like logo rules and, and stuff like that, which like was also devaluing athletes. So on multiple levels, I was in general pissed. Um, but I knew that if I was going to take that next step um, and like throw down the gauntlet and, you know, rag on those rules, I was going to have to step up and, you know, take my skiing to a higher level. And I started skiing on those the new skis at a much earlier date than anybody else started training on them still in the middle of the season um, and was able to get a good feeling for them, learn, you know, the difference in the physicality that it would take to, to compete at that level. So, um, yeah, I mean, it was, it was instrumental in my career to, to, to take that stand, I guess, but also to push myself to, to do what I did afterwards. Great. Let's talk a little bit about afterwards because heading into 2014, you were the favorite. Um, what was it like to be going into Sochi um, as the clear favorite with all of that pressure on your shoulders and then to win GS gold, gold in your, your key event, Mr. GS, like talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Like thinking back on my two Olympic gold medals, like there couldn't be a bigger juxtaposition between like the two Olympic experiences from like 2006 being a kid and like no expectations, just happy to be there too. 2014 being like the major favorite in the giant slum and having that pressure and you know doing the whole like media marketing cycle beforehand and all those various things like that was definitely the gauntlet and in ski racing as everybody knows here that like the best guys often don't win because there's many variables it's not a swimming pool it's not a track um it's not like track and field like if you're the world record holder you're gonna win it's in ski racing that's not the case at all um, anything can happen any given day. Um, so to be able to go down and yeah, you know, I had an amazing first run. I was super nervous before that first run, but to come down winning by a, a second and some like was a huge sigh of relief to like know that I was skiing well under that pressure and to have that little bit of buffer and then to be able to ski hard, but safe at times and to come through the lead, see the green light was like a huge weight off my shoulders. Um, you know, like pure joy and elation but like also just like like I was able to ski near my best or at my best under that kind of pressure and pull it out um was something you know was super special awesome thanks Ted let's talk about Alex um you and Alex have had a long <laughs> career together Alex your tech um he might be there on the other side of the camera with you um let me set up this whole little stage. I you know you back, did. So I had a hotel room background and tried to find a, a better setup. So I know <laughs> he's, he's a, he did a great job. He's a, he's a very protective, that's for sure. But um, yeah, Alex has been my tech for what has it been now? Like 11, 12 years, 12, 11 years. And um, we've grown to have, you know, a really close uh, friendship over the years. Um, both of us together it's uh it's been awesome i mean we've traveled thousands of miles in the van together um ridden countless lift rides um he said he's tuned over 40 pairs of gs he's just this year and is thinking he was trying to do a calculation on how many maybe thousands of pairs of skis he's done over the years but 
he's been so instrumental in, in what I've been able to do these last years, um, these last 11 years together. Um, as a, he's like acts not only as a tech, but a friend, as I said, but a coach, a sounding board. Um, somebody who I can like rant, rant, rant and rave to. Um, you know, when I'm pissed, I can like just like let him have it. And, you know, he can like sound off and be a voice of reason. And uh, it's been an invaluable relationship and it's a friendship that'll last a lifetime. And um, yeah, I mean, I just been super lucky to have have him as a tech i mean it's not like when i switched ahead i wasn't like alex and i knew really knew each other beforehand and to get paired together and then have the chemistry and relationship we had is uh is pretty amazing and special thank you thanks alex thanks alex <laughs> um i think emanuela is on the line and she has a question if you could unmute yourself Maybe Emmanuel, maybe not, and I can ask it. All right. Um, after Bodhi and Lindsay, you, the last giant, if you look back, what do you see? More fun or more hard work? <laughs> Nobody gets to this level without hard work. Um, that's just the reality of it. And for me, I like even though sometimes it was a slog, I I loved it. It was such a fun process. I mean, even like the days that sucked in the gym, I always knew like what the end game goal was. And um, yeah, I mean, it's so much fun. I mean, being able to like come up in that era where, you know, I got to ski through some of Bodie's best years, um, you know, having him as a teammate and a competitor and somebody who I looked up to as a kid, but also then racing with. And, um, you know, he was hugely instrumental. I mean, it's awesome to see like, I, Lindsay was obviously like amazing to like watch what she did in her career and like um, Julia and now like what Michaela has been able to do. It's just like, it's been amazing to watch like some of my teammates with their careers and it's been, been cool to be a part of. Um, so yeah, I mean, I've been lucky to, to have such an awesome team. Thank you. Um, Nick Fellows. Hey, I'm here. <laughs> Thanks, Emanuela. Do you have another question you wanted to ask? Well, yeah, the second question was that ski in the U.S. Uh, TV market, it's a little bit uh, perhaps under, um, let's say, underrated because you have the basketball, NBA, NFL, football, you have the baseball. Uh, uh, how do you think this could change in the future? I mean, it's the unfortunate reality and skiing and being the number one sport in the u.s is that it's just like we have too many big sports there's obviously geographical and socioeconomic and all these different variations of why skiing will never be that sport but to have people like Bodie and Lindsay, who's transcended the sport and brought the sport to the masses is amazing i think you really need to have stars that show the fun in the sport show you know, a different side, have a personality, I think is really important to, to build the sport in the US. Um, you know, all sports are star driven sports. Um, so having stars that can push it is, is important. Um, Mike Jake, who asked me a question earlier, he was, you know, the TV guy for the ski team for all those years. He would better be able to speak to the challenges of that, but it's a challenging market, you know, it's, there's a lot of competition for different sports. Um, but, you know, we have an awesome fan base in the US. A lot of people really love skiing. Um, it's just, you know, the expectations, I guess, can't or shouldn't or could never be to be the number one sport. Um, you know, it's just not, not a reality. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Manuela. Um, everyone, we we have a three minute time limit, but I'm dropping in a second, um, chat link in the chat function. <laughs> so when we run out of time here, um, Go ahead and you can use that one. Sorry about that. Um, but yeah, it's in the chat. So take a look at that. Um, Nick Fellows is on the line. Nick, do you have any questions for Ted? Hi, Ted. Um, I would just like to say thank you. Uh, you came to your peak when the sport was really suffering and you made ski racing cool again. <laughs> what would you do in the next chapter of your life to keep skiing cool, particularly with your son, Jax? 
winning medals recently as well. Uh, what's the, the game plan for Ted Ligeti after what is going to be a very sad and a very emotional Friday giant slalom next week? We will miss you. I can't say thank you enough, but I want to be able to tell your fans here in the UK, in London, what the next chapter has for you. Yeah, spending time with my family is definitely going to be the priority now. Um, I'm really looking forward to spending more time at home. Free skiing, that's definitely like something I look forward to doing a lot more. Um, being more even involved in my, in my business tread. Um, I still do a lot of stuff with my sponsors, you know, trying to like create cool, ten around, cool content around skiing. I mean, that's something I've always tried to do as a ski racer is not just like have my results be like the only time you see me skiing or the races is trying to like show the sport in different ways and show try to show it a different angle and different light and um that's like been a big part of like my career is trying to like show ski content in a cool way and i want to keep doing that i think there's still a lot to do on that front to uh you know to bring the sport into in a cooler light and i think you know that's one thing i'm proud that maybe i helped do is, is make it cooler and make it so you know from the free rider snowboard scene, like there's a little bit more respect that comes towards ski racing and th thought of in a, in a higher regard. And um, if I played a small role in that, that'd be, that'd be awesome. Thank you, Ted. Congratulations. Well, thank you thank so much. Ted, let's talk about, well, while we have more people um, coming on, let's talk a little bit about 2015 Val Beaver Creek, because I know you had been having a challenging season heading into that. You weren't necessarily the favorite there, but we were on home soil and you love Beaver Creek. And I know you wanted to throw down in front of the home crowd. Can you talk a little bit about that and all the emotion that you had? Cause I know you said you were probably more emotional after that win than ever before in the finish area. I've had so much success in Beaver Creek over all the years and um, having the world championship on home soil was, was super important to me to be able to have, you know, for us being racing from the U S every single race is an away race. Um, even, I mean, technically Beaver Creek's an away race, but we're in Europe for, you know, six months out of the year, living out our duffel bags, you know, all the Europeans go home at every week after a race and to be able to get the Europeans, living out of their duffel bag, I felt, felt was always like a nice advantage for us to be able to race on home soil and have world championships there was was awesome. Um, and I'd, ha I'd had a lot of confidence going to that. Um, but at the same time, you know, Marcel was on a different level in skiing and other guys were skiing really well. So after first run, I was in fourth place, I think, but I was only two tenths back and I really, really wanted that. And I, I don't think I've ever skied as well as I have in, in that second run. Um, I was hungry. I wanted it. And um, to lay down the run I did in front of the home crowd in that fashion and like see each of the next guys not be able to best it. It was just like, I'm not an emotional guy in general. And I haven't gotten that emotional from a lot of my races, but um that one, I definitely had an outburst of emotion being able to win that race. It just felt so important to me. Um, and that was awesome. It's, to, it's, it's awesome to be able to have, like, right there, seeing in the crowd, like, your friends and family and fans and home fans. It's, it's such a cool feeling to be, be able to win in front of them. So um, that was definitely one of the highlights. I mean, one of the most special moments of my career. Great. I think Julie has a question. Julie, do you want to unmute yourself? Okay, I think I got it unmuted. Can you hear me, Ted? Yes, I can. Hey, this is Julie Jagan from the Salt Lake Tribune. And I'm, yeah, I'm so sad to see you going because you're one of the main reasons that I came out here and uh, wanted to cover the Olympics. So, um, yeah, sure. sad, but, but very so impressed with your career. Um, well, now, I mean, thinking past Friday, do you expect that, um, would you like to have any involvement? with the drive to bring the Olympics back to Salt Lake City. And also, can you talk a little bit about how maybe having the Olympics here um, in your backyard inspired you? Yeah, having the Olympics in Salt Lake in 2002 was a huge part of like my inspiration as a kid. I was fortunate to have four run. Um, that was a big eye opener for me to be able to see, you know, the best in the world in their pinnacle day competing and how to see how they went about it and see how relatable it was. Um, that really opened my eyes. and 
and made the goal, even though at the time I wasn't anywhere close to being irrelevant to the ski, US ski team or to world ski racing, they made it seem like a, rel a relatively achievable goal after watching like how those guys approached the race and that it wasn't that much different. Uh, and to see, see the atmosphere was awesome. And some people every once in a while ask me like, what was your favorite Olympics? And I always say Salt Lake City, even though I didn't compete there, but they did an amazing job. It was, you know, amazing facilities still. Um, they're still used. The hills are awesome for skiing. It's, it'd be a pleasure to like, to have the Olympics there again, you know, I'd love to, to be involved in the effort to get it back there. It's, uh, it's such a like important event as a kid to be able to like have those in your backyard. And it's something that's really special. And, um, I would love to see it there again. I mean, I would have loved to race there while I was still in my peak, but you know, to be able to see it and have, you know, my kids be able to experience Olympics in their hometown would be, would be pretty amazing. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so Julie. I think Bill is on the line and I, hi, Bill. I, I didn't know you probably didn't expect to talk, but um, Bill Ligeti is on the line and, <laughs> and um, Pino has a question for you, Bill. Okay, I've got to show you, if you can see my screen, my, my assistant prepared a box of Kleenexes with Ted's photos all around them. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Pino, unmute yourself. I know you have a question for, for Bill. Thank you. Beauty. Got it. Hey, Bill. Hey, Ted. Hey, this, is, uh, this is making me feel awfully old. Uh, <laughs> Man, I would go back like 30 years or something, but um, I'm going to turn this one to your dad, who I've uh, had the pleasure to watch some ski races with. And the one thing I have to say about Ted was that, you know, as a as a homer, I always wanted, of course, Ted to win. And I never was nervous about Ted performing at his absolute highest ability. And I'm wondering, as his dad, how you can explain his ability to manage pressure and in the same moment, how did you handle it and the rest of the family? Boy, that's a tough question. I can't answer for, for Ted, but he, he seems to have figured it out uh, very well and doesn't seem to be phased much by pressure. Oh, figures out what to do, and he's a very quick study. I guess when you're skiing fast, you need to make decisions quickly, and he does, and he makes good decisions. Um, I guess as far as a parent, watching ski racing, there were different kinds of pressures for different races. If it was Kitzbühel, it was just, please make it down and, and please make it down in one piece. <laughs> if it was um, races where he had a good chance of winning, then it was um, sort of nervousness that everything went well and that the, he didn't make bobbles and that the light didn't go bad in the middle of his run and nobody else's and um, just wanting him to do well. So um, interesting pressures, but all good. Just an amazing ride. We never would have, never could have expected the outcome and just couldn't be more proud. Bill, we wish you were here. We yeah. Wish, yeah, we wish we were too. <laughs> Um, thank you, Bill. That's awesome. And then I just wanted to um, throw it to uh, Brian Pinelli. I think you have another question and then we could probably get a sneak one or two more in there and wrap it up. Yeah, Ted, thanks. One, one more from me. Uh, I don't know how many people recall. It's been a, a few years, but you won two editions of the Alpine Rock Fest, a very innovative, creative event started by Phil McNichol. I know you've always talked about, you know, we, we talked about it back then, innovating in the sport, being more creative, uh, you know, going outside the box. Uh, just tell me about your Alpine Rock Fest experiences. Where did they stand? And does ski racing need more of this type of event to, uh, you know, to, to push it forward? Yeah, Alpine Rock Fest is a lot of fun. Um, the event format was really cool. I think what's tough about ski racing is in giant slalom or slalom you get one run i mean two runs and that's all you really see your favorite skiers 
Um, what was amazing about the Rock Fest kind of format is you saw a bunch of runs and it was kind of a knockout formula. Um, there was a like, cool jump in it. They just like the atmosphere was like more of a, a party style atmosphere, you know, big prize money. So there's a lot of pressure to still to win. Um, and it was just a pleasure. I mean, it was so much fun to be able to race there in a little different scenario from a normal World Cup against the best guys in the world. Um, and to be able to have, you know, what a hundred thousand dollars is <laughs> out there to, to win was, uh, was a big incentive to, to, to put a lot of, lot of, lot on the line. So those are fun. Um, you know, I love, I love when there's alternatives to fist for ski racing, you know, it's nice to have those pressures for them to like, for fists to like adapt and change and, and make steps forward. And when there's some little bit of competition or a little something different out there, that is, I think, overall good for our sport. Um, you know, I've been involved with the World Pro Ski Tour a little bit, done a few of those, and kind of doing maybe some of those as, as they fit my schedule in the future, just to keep the competitive juices going. Um, but I just, I love skiing, competing, and having those kind of races was was so much fun. Good stuff, thanks. Thanks, and you just answered Guido's question, which was going to be about will will the World Pro Ski Tour still be on for you? Um, does anyone else? Uh, go ahead, go ahead, Ted. You can speak to that a little bit more. Um, yeah, I, I do like look forward to looking, I'm looking forward to doing some of the World Pro, Pro Ski Tours. It's obviously a totally different atmosphere, different format than I'm normally used to racing, but also it's two days away from home as opposed to six weeks away from home. So it's a more manageable schedule and um, it's a fun atmosphere. It's fun racing against, you know, a lot of my like ex teammates, a lot of young up and comers. It's uh, it's a cool atmosphere in that sense. It's a lot of fun. It's a challenging format that I definitely need to improve upon and get better at and learn. Um, so that'll be fun to fun to do um, them here and there as, as it fits. Great, does anyone else have any more questions? Cause if not, I have, okay, Pino, go ahead. Um, Ed, uh, anyway, thank you. As I listen to all this, it's uh, it's all coming back and, and we're gonna miss you terribly. But uh, with that, I hope uh, that you're not going away. And I'm, I'm curious if you have any aspirations of getting involved in the leadership of the sport. And uh, I know you probably have a long list but maybe a short list of things you'd like to see change. <laughs> um yeah i mean i would like to stay involved in you know the direction of the sport i think um this spring there's a good opportunity that you know the fist president changes this time around and johan elias who i know really well from head who's the ceo of head and owns head um is running for and i think has a good chance of winning i think he has a good vision he's very athlete focused he has a good business background he has all the things you'd want He's not Swiss, which is good also to, you know, change the, change, <laughs> change the, the nationality and the guard there. Um, so I'm really hoping, you know, that he can, he can win. And I've talked to him a bunch, a bunch, about a bunch of different ideas. Um, I know he's taking a lot of input from a lot of different people on how we can evolve and make this sport better. So, you know, I'm hoping that he wins and I can stay involved um, with the sport there. Um, on, on the leadership side of things. Um, what I would change from the get-go, I think like there's a lot of format issues. I mean, I could go, this is a half an hour discussion. So, you know, I could break it down for a long time, but I think one like couple of quick things would be like first and second runs within like a half an hour of each other. So like condensed schedule of races, um, having like open style races where, you know, it's like similar to like open style and tennis, like we have the Austri Austrian Open, you have the Italian Open, like you have all the World Cups become like World Cup finals-esque events, you know, instead of having 80 racers in an event, you know, you have maybe 40 and you, those 10 that aren't in the top 30 qualify through World Cup B or Europa Cups the weekend before and um, trying to make it like more races where everybody's there and it's more of a championship style event. And I think that would be a huge benefit for the sport, add some excitement, add a new feeling to it. Um, and I have a lot more ideas, but like I said, I, we could talk about this for the next half an hour. 
<laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, Ted, I know uh, we're nearing the end here of our time with you. Thank you so much for giving us all of this time and thank you so much for everything you've done for the sport. I do have one more question and it's about, um, you, you have a lot of people to thank uh, along the way and, and you've, had, you've seen a lot of coaches come and go, but the one coach that has been consistent for your career is Forrest Carey, also someone fiercely protective, humble, quiet, um, matches your personality very well. Can you talk a little bit about Forrest and what he meant to you, means to you? Yeah, I've been really lucky to have a lot of amazing coaches over the years. Um, Forrest has been with me for most of my career. Forrest, like the year before I made the ski team was like trying to make a comeback. And I remember racing Norams with him and um, his competitiveness. I mean, he is like so freaking competitive when we like, play pickup basketball. I mean, he's still, he's knee replaced and he still keeps up with us kids and so competitive about it. I mean, he, nobody fouls me harder in a basketball game than Forrest. And <laughs> it's uh, having that personality on the road with you. He doesn't want any of the tension or credit. He doesn't thr thrive on any of that. He wants to make skiing fun, but also strives for the best results of all of his athletes. Um, you know, works doggedly hard for, for all of us, um, fights for us, um, you know, in a, lot, in a lot of ways. I mean, he, he definitely puts himself out there for his athletes, which is really special. Um, and, you know, I'm happy to call him a friend. I mean, Jax and Trudy are, you know, best friends. That's my son and his daughter who are about the same age. And, um, you know, I'm just super lucky to have had him for all these years because it's a, uh, it's great when you can have that consistency, but also have that camaraderie and, um, you know, shorthand and the communication we have and all that. It's, it's just, uh, it's been amazing. I feel so lucky to have had him all those years. Thank you, Ted. Um, round of applause for Ted and your awesome career. And we can't wait to celebrate you, um, you on the 19th. And thanks again, everyone for joining. And thank you, Ted, for everything you've done for the sport. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.